and uh, we'll begin a new series uh, next Sunday morning. I won't tell you what it is. You just have to come and find out. So uh, we will begin a whole new study next Sunday morning, and I'm excited about that. This morning, I want to talk to you about time to get serious. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to get serious. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just need to get serious, don't we? I tell my kids that all the time. You know, you need to get, you need to get serious, you know, and they, they do need to get serious. So I've got one that's about to be a senior, and he's just started working at Brookshire's, praise the Lord for that. And, you know, and he's realizing, you, you know, as you get a little older, you have to get serious about some things. There he is right there. Hey, Ranger. And, uh, you know, he's, he's learning that you, you have to start getting serious about life and about some things. Now, it doesn't mean that we still don't have a good time, have fun, and enjoy life. Amen. God wants us to do all those things. But, but at some point, we've got to get serious about this journey and about this life. And sometimes we need to get serious about our relationship with God. Amen? So as we conclude here, at the conclusion of Revelation, God sounds the alarm loud and clear to the church as He did at the beginning of Revelation that the time is near. And things are going to happen quickly when they begin to happen. I mean, it is amazing all of the things that have happened just since we've been in this study. The things that are unfolding and going on in the world today has been head spinning. It's even hard to really keep up with everything that is happening globally in our world today. But in Revelation 22 and 6, the scripture reads, And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. I'm thankful that the Lord is merciful to us, and that he shows us through the Bible through the prophets, the things which will take place shortly just before he returns. Aren't you thankful that you have that information? Aren't you thankful that you have that knowledge and that it creates within you a hopeful expectation that the Lord is about to return? I like what the scripture tells us that as we see all these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Creates excitement in me. For some people, it may create dread. I want you to know, as a child of God, as one who's been saved by the blood of the Lamb, it helps me to get excited because I know that this thing is about to wrap up. So things are getting serious as we look across our planet. And I just want to highlight a, a couple of things here this morning as we conclude our study. I just want to kind of bring back to you some current events and things that are happening just to remind us that we are close. If you remember Matthew 24, 25, Jesus said, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. In Matthew 24, 37, Jesus says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So we might ask the question, how were the things in Noah's day? Well, the book of Genesis in chapter 6, verse 11 tells us the earth was corrupt before God and it was filled with violence. Sounds very much like our world today. And we are all painfully aware that today's headlines are full of tragic stories of violence. Mass shootings, homicide, terrorism, and rioting are all too familiar events that are happening with greater frequency and intensity all the time. Have you noticed that? These things have always happened throughout history, but it's the intensity, it's the frequency that is so astonishing. We even see political violence where Violence is perpetrated by governments on their own people. 
President Assad of Syria just two weeks ago killed his own citizens with chemical weapons. Violence is one of the leading causes of death for people aged 15 to 44 years of age worldwide. Violence is a universal evil that is destroying communities and countries and is destabilizing civil societies worldwide. The other conditions that will be prevalent just before the return of Christ will be wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Matthew 24, verses 6 to 8 tells us, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So we are seeing today before our very eyes the rising of nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom right on the news. We can see that war is on the horizon. What we see developing is not just some kind of a skirmish or some kind of altercation. But what we're seeing developing has the ingredients of a full-scale world war. North Korea is no doubt a nation that is preparing for full-scale war with the United States and its allies. So now we have North Korea, Russia, Iran and Syria, who form a dangerous coalition of nations that are ready to use military force to advance their goals of power and domination. Even just this past week, and in our study, we talked a lot about the nation of Turkey. And just this past week, the Turkish president won by a narrow margin a referendum to give him sweeping and vast powers to the point of doing away with their parliamentary rule of government. And remember that Turkey is a key country in the end times and is the country that connects Europe with the Middle East. The kings of the east are positioning themselves with military might to set the stage for the last days. And the Turkish president has positioned himself politically to become a power broker between Europe and the Middle East. All the players are beginning to move into place. Can I remind us once again, the time is near. So there's something that we need to do in preparation for what's about to happen and I told you it's time to get serious so the first thing I want to tell you about this morning it's time to get serious about the Word of God Revelations 1 and 3 the scripture said and when we first started this study it said blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near and over the past five months, that's how long we've been in this study, we've read the words of this prophecy, we have heard the words of this prophecy, and now we must keep the things close to our heart that are written in it. It is amazing that God declared in the first chapter of Revelation that there would be a blessing for those who read, heard, and kept the words of Revelation. Then in the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus comes back again and declares that in chapter 22, verse 7, where he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Kind of like bookends. Started out with that statement, and he concludes with that statement. And I want to remind us today, it is a dangerous thing to tamper with the word of God. Not just a dangerous thing to tamper with the book of Revelation, but it also is a dangerous thing to tamper with the Word of God in its entirety. The one who alters it 
will be disciplined in some way. In Revelations 22, verses 18 through 19, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. The promise to blessed came with a command. The command was to keep the words of the prophecy of this book. To keep means to guard and to protect, to watch over, to preserve and keep intact. And can I tell you, that's one of our highest responsibilities here at this local church, is to keep the Word of God, is to preserve the Word of God, is to keep the Word of God intact. But with the blessings, there was also given a warning. We must not add to the Word of God or take anything from it. We must be committed to the Word of God. And if you want to be blessed, obey and keep the Word of God or other, or otherwise we will face severe consequences. If we're going to make it in these last days, we must be committed to the Word of God just as it is written. No diluting it down or modifying it to fit our lifestyle. We must keep the Word just as it is written. Amen? You cannot modify it. We live in a Christian society today where the Word of God is treated like a buffet. Where you go along the line and you pick what you like and what blesses you. But if it's something that kind of rubs you the wrong way or doesn't really fit you where you're living right now, you'll just leave it and you won't take it. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to be blessed today in these last days, it is imperative that we take the Word of God seriously and that we receive it and we live it just as it is written. I don't know where you're at this morning and where you stand with the Word of God, but I want to tell you it's time to get serious about the Word of God. I spoke here Wednesday night about having a daily devotion with God, about receiving the manna from heaven. And I want you to know that if you're going to be able to stand in these last days, in these perilous times, you've got to find somewhere in the course of your day to get into the Word of God and into a place of prayer if you're going to make it. Just coming to church, that's wonderful. I'm glad you're here. And I want to be of any help to you that I can ever be. And I don't take it for granted that people come out and sit in the pew and listen and support the gospel. I want you to know I am grateful and humbled for that. But I just want to tell you today that if this is the only time that you're getting the Word, you are opening yourself up to being vulnerable. You are opening up yourself to all kinds of temptations and things that are out to destroy destroy you and your family. I want to tell you, if you're going to make it in these last days, you've got to find a place to get into the Word on your own. So I encourage young couples, families, be sure you're getting into the Word of God at the house. Not just here at God's house, but at your own house. Psalm 18 and 30 says, As for God... His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord is proven. I want to tell you that the Word of God is proven. It works. Can I get a witness? Amen. It has stood the test of times. It speaks to every aspect of our lives. It doesn't matter what season of life you're in right now today. I want to tell you, the Word of God is speaking to you. The Word of God is relevant to you today. It doesn't matter what it is, if it's your marriage, if it's your finances, relationships, your job, your health. I want to tell you, the Word of God addresses every bit of it today. The Word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. Psalm 33 and 4 says, For the Word of the Lord is right. How many believe it's right? Amen. I have found the Word of the Lord to be right. 
And all his work is done in truth. Psalm 119, 11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. we got to get serious about the word of God. On a corporate level as a church and on a personal level as an individual believer. Second thing I want to talk to you about that we got to get serious about is our worship. And I appreciate the worship here this morning. How many enjoyed the worship here this morning? I felt the presence of God in our worship. Amen. And I am so thankful to be able to have a place to come and worship. Revelation 22 verses 8 through 9 says, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. And the last thing he said was, worship God. John makes the mistake of worshiping an angel a second time. Some of you remember, we've already talked about this. Over in chapter 19, verse 10, he got rebuked for doing the very same thing. For falling down before the feet of an angel and worshiping the angel. And here he does, he does it a second time. How many of you ever got rebuked and you ended up doing it again? Amen. Well, John the Revelator, he got rebuked for it. Here he is again getting rebuked for it again. But I'm thankful for God's grace and mercy this morning. Amen. And I want to tell you, here in lies the credibility of the gospel. And that John admits that he made the same mistake twice. He's the writer. He's, the, he's being inspired by God. He's being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this revelation. But he doesn't omit it. He admits this in his writing. And we live in a world that wants to omit the truth. But God has called us to admit and declare the truth even when it's not in our favor. It's time in the last days to stand for truth. I'm going to remind you the truth will set you free. Amen. You need to be set free. You need to be able to worship God in the liberty and the freedom of the Spirit. But first, you've got to operate and live in truth. John 8, 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the only way you're going to get free in worship is to live in the truth. Some people cannot get in the Spirit because they're not free. And the reason they're not free is because they're not living in the truth. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Is anybody here since some freedom? Amen. Go ahead and raise your hand. Let's go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But I'm going to tell you, if anybody begins to compromise the truth of God's Word, we begin to try to dilute it down. We begin to try to be a seeker-friendly church and make people feel comfortable living in sin. I want you to know that it will be that day that we no longer begin to feel the liberty and the power of God's presence in our midst. So you have a commitment from me as your pastor to keep preaching the truth of God's Word. No matter how abrasive, no matter how offensive, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, I want you to know that we got to get serious about the Word of God. We've got to get serious about our worship because time is near, church. We've got to get free. We must hear the voice of the angel when he declare, declared, worship God. We must have the truth because it is only in the truth that we're going to be able to worship God. When we come to church, we need to get down to business and get serious about worshiping God. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Time to get serious about worshiping God. I didn't come here 
to see who's all here or who's not here. I didn't come here to look over my shoulder. I didn't come here to look across the pew. I didn't come here to see what you got on. I didn't come here to see what kind of car you pulled up in. I want you to know that I came here to get serious today. I came here to worship the Lord. Amen. Praise God. What we got to do to get serious about our worship is that we need to walk through the doors and enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Amen. I, I want to encourage you. Refrain. Please try to refrain from coming through the gates with complaints on your lips. Amen. Don't hinder what God wants to do here in the house of the Lord. Amen. If you've got a complaint, I'll be more than glad to hear it. But please wait until after service is over. Amen. We need to let there be the freedom and the liberty of the Spirit. Amen. And I don't want to be the person to hinder it. Well, praise the Lord. I think I'm preaching better than y'all are amen in this morning. Amen. Praise God. Well, I believe the church's greatest days are still ahead. How many of y'all believe that? I believe we're just scratching the surface of what God wants to do here at the Blossom Church of God. But again, we got to live in the truth of God's Word and begin to worship God in spirit and in truth. And when we do that, there will be a move of God that has shaped the foundation of our community. There will be a move of God that has shaped the foundation of our workplaces. There will be a move of God that has shaped the foundation of our local schools in this area. There will be a move of God that has shaped the foundations of our courthouses. Amen. There will be a move of God that has shaped the foundations of our homes and our families. And people will feel conviction again. And they'll begin to come in and fill up church houses. And begin to fall into the altars. And begin to cry out to the Lord once again as they did back in the old days. They used to tell me stories about in the old days. And I wasn't around so I'm just going on what they told me. But some of you might be able to remember. They used to tell me that come Sunday night they would pack the church house and they would raise the windows and people that weren't living right would come to church anyway and they would sit out on the hoods of the car and smoke their cigarettes and listen to the preaching of the Word of God. People still came to the house of the Lord. They didn't matter what was going on in their life. They knew they had enough conviction to know that I need to hear the Word of God. You couldn't keep them out of the church house. I'm praying for that same kind of revival, that same kind of atmosphere again, that people will just come in here and say, I don't know why I'm here, but I just felt something drawing me in. Brother Randall talked about it this morning when we was commenting in Sunday school. I want to tell you, it's not the music that's going to draw people here. It's not my preaching that's going to draw people here. What it is, it's the Spirit of the Lord that's going to draw people into this place. Amen. That's what we got to have is the power and the presence of God. Serious. So it's time. It's time for the church to rise up in these last days and begin to praise God with a voice of triumph. Not a voice of discouragement, not a voice of defeat. Not a voice of woe is me, but it is time for the church to rise up with a voice of triumph. We don't need to let nobody or anything shut down our praise. Amen. Somebody in here, you need to get your praise on. Some of you have been telling me, I've been talking to some of you. And, I'll, and I'm excited about what God's doing in your life. And some of you been telling me, some of you say, man, I just sometimes I just feel like taking off running. Sometimes I just almost feel like I lose, I'm going to lose control. I, and I, and I want to tell you, go ahead, get your praise on. 
It's okay to lose control. Amen. Is it okay if somebody ran the aisles in here? Has anybody got any objections to that? Would it be okay if somebody shouted in this place? Anybody got any objections to that? Would it be okay if somebody might jump to pew every now and then? Does anybody got any objection to that? It, what was, somebody might just want to dance across the front of the church. Amen. Does anybody got an objection to that? Anybody? Praise the Lord. Well, you're free to worship just as you so choose. Amen. Don't you worry about what your neighbor thinks. Don't you worry about what anybody else is going to say or do. Amen. Because I want to tell you, when it's time to praise God, get your praise on. Amen. The last thing. We got to make a serious decision. Revelation 22, 10 through 11. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. I'm going to explain that here in just a second, but I want to ask our musicians and singers to come if you would. We might look at that and we think, what in the world? He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. But he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You see, the time is at hand. And it is time to get serious about where we stand with God. It's time that you really know this morning where you stand with God. Because he said, let the unjust be unjust. Let the filthy be filthy. Let the righteous be righteous and let the holy be holy. And what, what the Word of God is telling us, there's, there's no more straddling the fence. You either are, pardon the English, but you, or you ain't. You either in or you're out. There's no more living one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Come on, church, help me out. You cannot do that and make it to heaven. You've got to decide where you stand today with God. You either are or you ain't. Where are you standing today? Where are you trying to live? But the scripture is very clear that we've got to get serious. It's time to get serious about our relationship with God. It's a call to live holy and to live righteous. Oh, really? Yeah. Holy and righteous. I am so thankful for our heritage as the church of God. Our church was born in a holiness movement up in the hills of North Carolina, right on the state line of Tennessee with good, hard-working folk who got hungry and who decided there must be something more. And I'm thankful for holiness and righteousness. Anybody thankful for holiness and righteousness? I know those two words in today's culture are not received very well, but I want you to know that it still is the requirement of God's people that they would live holy, amen, that they would live righteous in this present age in which we live today. Ephesians 4.24 That you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Nowhere in there does it say that, that we have the option. Or that we can kind of decide how we are going to live our lives. But it says that we are to put on the new man. Which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. It's time to get serious and shed the things that are hindering us. To be who God called us to be. 
I'd like for you to stand with me this morning. Praise God. What I want us to do this morning, I've asked them to sing a upbeat song. We still got that on the schedule. Good, good. I'm and I, and I just feel like there's some things that people need to lay aside. You notice I went like that. Some things you just need to lay aside. You need to get serious about your walk with the Lord. You need to get serious about your devotion. You need to get serious about your worship. You need to get more serious about your decision with God. In Hebrews 12 and 1, the Scripture says, Let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which doeth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. It's time to run the race that is set before us. Can I tell you that the finish line is coming into view? So here today, we're going to sing Glory Land Road. Is that right? Many of you can see, begin to see the lights of home. Ooh, as I begin to read the Bible, I'm starting to see the lights of home. <gasps> Praise God. So we're going to worship here. You can just worship where you're at. If you need to step out and walk the aisle, if you need to walk around the front, if you want to come down here and kneel, you need to pray in the altar, I want you to know you're free to do whatever you want. Just don't leave. <laughs> Amen. Let's worship the Lord here for the next few moments and just take your liberty in the Lord.